my pleasure to introduce your interviewer, Asia Nunez. Also, Asia is a second year Shiloh student and also a PACE leader. She orchestrated this entire event because of her passion for gaming. So Asia, take it away. passionate about esports and entrepreneurship because I feel as though it can provide a lot of opportunities to students. It's my honor to welcome and introduce Joe Marsh. Joe Marsh is the CEO of T1 Entertainment and Sports, a global esports joint venture created by Comcast Spectacor and SK Telecom in October 2019. Joe previously served as Chief Business Officer of Comcast Spectacor Gaming Division in the Philadelphia Fusion Esports franchise that competes in the Overwatch League. Joe graduated with a degree in marketing from Millersville University and later earned his MBA in finance, analytics, and strategic management from Villanova University. Can we please give him a hand? Esports is competitive video gaming, not dissimilar to traditional stick and ball sports. You know, you're watching the best of the best compete, uh, both at the professional level and the collegiate level. And now um, it's coming to the high school levels as well. So it's really um, you know, transforming kind of how you have the pipeline with traditional sports. When you're playing at six years old, you're finally starting to see that pipeline with students you know, being able to play at college you know, professionally as well. So it's exciting. What's your involvement in this? So I have the uh, absolute pleasure to oversee T1, uh, which historically is probably one of the greatest esports orgs of all time. Uh, we have the greatest player of all time uh, in, under our umbrella named Faker, considered the Michael Jordan of esports. He's the winningest player of all time. Uh, he's probably the highest earning individual of all time. He's also now a co-owner of T1. So we uh, have the kind of athlete that's transcended the sport in Korea in particular, Faker is a national treasure. He's up there with BTS and actors from Squid Game. He gets invited to the Blue House, which is the Korean White House. So he's um, he's a true celebrity that happens to be a pro gamer. Versus you know a lot of pro gamers that you see in the U.S. don't kind of get out of their bubble. He is uh, squarely out of that bubble. What were you like as a kid? Did you play video games? I did. So as a kid, I played traditional sports and video games. I was playing a sport a season growing up. But I also played games. Um, you know, my first memories of playing games were on Nintendo. I didn't get into PC games until after I became CEO of T1, because barrier to entry is too great. Three thousand dollars for a PC, you don't have it. But a console I had growing up. So I played a lot of console games. Some of my favorite games of all time are uh, Maniac Mansion uh, on Nintendo, uh, GoldenEye, and then 64. And then in college, I played a ton of Call of Duty in the dorms where we'd open the doors to the bathroom so you could see the other people playing. It was like the original land back in the early 2000s. Uh, and we would just scream at each other while we played games and still went to class. So you graduated with a degree in marketing and an MBA in finance, analytics, and strategic management. Did you initially see yourself having a career at a company related to esports? No. Uh, I got into, uh, I'm like the poster boy for uh, HR at Comcast. I interned and never left. So uh, I was on the traditional sports route. We owned the Philadelphia Flyers of the NHL. Uh, at the time, we also owned the 76ers uh, of the NBA. Uh, I wanted to do sports marketing. I wanted to you know, work on um, traditional sports. And it wasn't until 2017 that I even knew professional gaming was a, a potential career. Um, we bought into the Overwatch League super late. We were part of the last team in the league. And they were looking for someone to help Tucker Roberts run the uh, operation. Uh, I happened to be the youngest person on the floor by 25, 30 years. So naturally I was the, the good fit for the opportunity uh, and kind of took off from there and fell in love with you know, everything that we've built in the gaming space. It's, uh, it's certainly different than the typical office 9 to 5 culture that I was uh, very accustomed to. Um, what skills did you learn while getting your degree that you still use today? Oh man, uh, I think for my MBA, which is so important, was just uh, people management and kind of compartmentalization. While I was getting my MBA, I also had two little kids under five. Uh, so definitely had to learn good time management skills. Um, 
I kind of joke that while working at T1, I'm getting like a second MBA in international <coughs> business because doing business in Korea is much different than doing business in the US. So I've had to kind of learn on the fly, uh, so to speak, over the past three and a half years. Um, but definitely being really strong on the finance side, um, especially with scaling up a business, uh, and in particular in COVID, um, was, was really difficult and challenging. But because we structured it after traditional style sports businesses, especially on the commercial rights side and, and the revenue generating piece, uh, we were able to kind of scale much quicker than uh, some of our contemporaries. How has your past work experience helped you in your current position? Um, it's interesting because I was never a CEO of anything. I was always a worker, and I think I, I take that to my role at T1. I'm, I'm still rolling up my sleeves and, and doing the little things. Uh, there's no ivory towers at T1. There's no uh, special treatment because I'm the boss. The only difference is at the end of the day in the meeting, the people are staring at me to make the final call. Um, but I try to empower uh, my staff. I try to hire great people and let them do their job. Um, you know, I, I, I've learned from good bosses and I've learned from bad bosses. And I know kind of where I want to be on my own. And I try to take the, the good things I've learned along the way and kind of make them uh, a part of my management style with my team. And uh, I think it's done okay so far. You mentioned this a little bit before, but what are some assumptions you made when, before you went into the Asian market as compared to now and some challenges or barriers you face? Uh, obviously, language barriers, it was the, the toughest one. But I think even bigger than that was business culture in Korea versus US. So um, business culture in Korea is very much uh, not as transactional as the US. It's more about relationship building, um, a lot of repeat uh, meetings before doing a deal. Um, you know, the, the night culture and having important dinners and, and having that social aspect of the business meetings is an important part of Korean culture, whereas it's not as prevalent in the, uh, the culture I was accustomed to at Comcast. Um, I think the level and culture of respect is super important in, in Korea. It's down to where you sit at the table and the mirroring culture of you and I are sitting across from each other and you're drinking, then I'm drinking, or you're eating, I'm eating. It's, it's very much um, you know, part of you know, the gifting culture and how you shake hands and how you handle a business card and um, you know, learning all those little nuances and also having to learn the region quite a bit. You know, learning the, the do's and don'ts of you know specific partners or you know challenges Korea's face with certain neighbors, I've had to learn all that on the fly uh, and make sure that um, you know I don't make any missteps as a as a Westerner coming into Korea. Did you start picking up some Korean or fully Chinese? Uh, a little bit. I, I had a tutor uh, from NYU for a little bit, and then she graduated and got a job, so she kind of dropped me. But I, I can say. Like, Anyaseo, Bangyap Samdinap, Chonen, Cho Marseo, like, how are my name's Joe. I know how to say thank you, uh, and I know how to give good gifts in Korea. Like, you can never out gift a Korean business person. I, when we gifted someone a really nice jacket, they came up with a 3D printed statue. <laughs> so I was like, I can't win. So. <laughs> you also talked about this a little bit, but how is your experience interacting with? Or, maybe more so marketing to a foreign audience? So we have the challenge of marketing both domestically in Korea but globally. So, you know, we, because I took over uh, T1, which was formerly inside a conglomerate in their marketing sports division, um, as a standalone business, we had to do a lot more marketing, a lot more content, sponsor activation. So early on in, in my tenure and kind of as we reinvented T1 from SKT T1, um, I would say we got a lot of arrows <laughs> thrown at us from doing a lot of the business changes because we were going from being a marketing component to a standalone company with a board and a budget and financial targets. So um, we had to find ways to generate revenue and that's oh, sometimes at odds with how the community or fans view the business. They wanted to view it as a game team. It's really a sports entertainment company. So um, learning how to, to navigate the, the expectations of your consumers as well as the expectations of your board. It's a lot of relationship management. In the future, what direction do you see T1 taking? Um, so with eSports winter upon us, which kind of right now in the period of eSports, is you're seeing a lot of consolidation. Um, I think a lot of the venture capital money that came into gaming in 2017, 2018 really um, 
was a hindrance to the growth. I think they were looking for unicorn businesses or, or you know, getting into gaming. And what that really did was provided a lot of capital into a lot of inexperienced people's hands. And what really ended up happening is revenues did not outpace where the expenses for player salaries went. So whereas revenues slowly grew, you know, five to twenty percent, player salaries went from an average of a hundred thousand dollars to in our league nine hundred thousand dollars per player. So it just grew too fast and now with the, the VC money going away, um, you're seeing a lot of smaller teams fall down, but a lot of the bigger teams will probably survive. Uh, things that we've done to change that, uh, to kind of prepare for the winter, as we scaled down our teams, uh, we only operate two main games now in League of Legends and Valorant, both Riot Games. Um, we've shifted uh, the staff that we've had in the U.S., and now we're strictly focused on staffing in Korea, um, and we're focusing on ancillary businesses. So uh, our PC bond opens up in April. Our academy business we launched two years ago. Season two of our webtoon, which is an owned IP that we can hopefully eventually turn into a streaming service, you know, TV, a show, a movie. Um, that that'll drop later this year. Uh, we have a full merchandise line. So we we opened up a coffee shop and a little arena next to our main office. So we've tried to diversify our business to not be so dependent on sponsorship dollars, which are harder to come by as some of the uh, traditional sponsors pull back. These are all very good questions. <laughs> Thank you. How would you describe the direction T1 as an organization takes in comparison to competitors? Um, I would say there's similarities to the base level of business uh, from the team operations of what we're doing compared to everybody else. I think where we differ is that we like to be market movers and, and not followers. So we tend to, to jump into a business first in order to you know capture the market. Um, you know, we, we are fortunate to have probably one of the larger fan bases, if not the largest, in all of Korea and Southeast Asia. Uh, we're the most popular foreign team in China as well, so that gives us ample opportunity. So uh, we, we tried to, you know, initially in my tenure at T1, we tried to be global, capture the West. You know, with the winter coming, we realized that it was more important to continue to solidify our base in Korea and also expand to the East instead. So we pivoted our, our strategy more towards trying to capture markets in the Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia, and eventually, hopefully, India via mobile gaming. That's a huge opportunity um, in, with their player base there. What were your initial goals when you became the CEO? <laughs> Not screw it up was probably <laughs> one. There was, there was a, lot of, a lot of money put in by, by Comcast and SK Telecom to, to grow the company. Um, I, I was definitely trying to make T1 a more global brand. Um, we did a complete rebrand upon doing the joint venture, so going from SKT T1 um, to T1 was a, was a big lift with a logo change, and that could have went poorly, but it went really well. Um, you know, the fans have been receptive to kind of the change that we've been trying to do and um, some of the innovations we've taken uh, and to push the ball forward in Korea with gaming. And one of the things that was a big change was, you know, T1 was setting the bar in terms of sponsorships and cash that you can generate from the business, whereas prior to that, a lot of game teams in Korea would just take trade and no cash, so just product for, for exposure. So we were really helping kind of lift the bar there in the market. Uh, and we brought in some really great partners like Nike, BMW, Samsung, Red Bull. Um, so we did a really great job. Gucci's one of our partners, which is unique to the space, but I enjoy the, the, the free free goodies they've given us. Uh, so it's one of the, one of the perks of the job. Um, but we've, we've done a really good job of bringing in non-traditional sponsors um, to the market and, and kind of highlighted all the great things uh, that you know, Korea and the impact has offered. How is your work-life balance at CU? Um, I tell this to my staff all the time. I, I, I'm probably not the example to emulate just because uh, I keep. I, I live on the East Coast in, in Pennsylvania. I keep Korean hours, so I'm up two, three in the morning. It's a 14-hour time zone change. Um, and when I'm in Korea, I'm still keeping the odd hours anyway, because I can't talk to my family if you know I, I don't, I'm not awake at those times. So um, instead of work-life balance, I like to call it more of a boundary setting. Um, it's so important for my staff and myself to kind of have those times to get away when you're not supposed to be working. So whether that's a family meal on Fridays or what you're doing on the weekend, um, it's more about personally setting your boundaries so your colleagues know that, hey, like, during this window, I'm not available. Um, because with, with cell phones and computers and work from home culture during COVID, you were always available. So getting away uh, was super important. I think 
I've been to Hawaii now three times since COVID started. I kept going away to the islands. Whereas, um, you know, I have to push my staff in Korea to get away. We're even implementing a, a week off period for the whole company. So everyone has to take a break. Last year, a lot of staff didn't take take the breaks that they were, you know, afforded via their, their employment packages. So I really want to make sure that they're taking care of their health. And, you know, we do physicals for the, for the staff every two years. And it's so important to take care of your, your body. Um, my COO, John, who was 40, passed away um, two years ago um, from a sudden heart attack. He was perfectly healthy and playing basketball with my staff. So that was a wake up call. Uh, I lost a player who passed away two months later. So it's just, life is super short. So it's, we're, we're trying to make sure that there was definitely more of a balance versus you know the work really, really hard culture we have in Korea. Um, one of the good things I think for my staff would say is, I definitely keep a little bit more of a Western feel in the office um, in terms of some of the norms, cultural norms. You can say no to me if you have an opportunity to go out with your family or your girlfriend or boyfriend. You don't have to because your boss asks you to come to dinner or watch an event to do that. So I definitely try to give them a little bit more leeway that I was accustomed to when I was working in, in America. Um, but also, my staff works super hard. So it's just trying to find the balance for them individually. Yeah, I definitely think in Asian culture, it's very typical for it to be just work, work, work. So it's good well, to hear. Well, part of it too is they're competing from fourth grade to get to the best schools, best high schools. If you don't get to the right college, you have to go to college in the US. If you don't go to Sky, which is the four big universities there, a lot of kids go to the US. So they're competing at a super young age um, for those coveted slots academically. So it makes sense why they work the way they do. Um, it's just, I try to make sure that they have some balance because it's, work's supposed to be fun. That's why you want to put the hours in because we are in a cool space. Gaming is, is, is fun to, compete in and, and do cool things in, but if you're burnt out, you're not good for not only us, but your family. What are some failures or challenges you went faced, and how did you overcome them? Um, let's see, I, I, I haven't always been the best messenger, uh, I think. Uh, you know, I think I've had a couple step on the rake moments uh, during my, my few years, um, and, and it's more of, not out of malice, it's more of out of, you know, my, understanding of what the expectations were. So things like that, uh, falling short of our, our goals um, of winning, I think. We have, having won three world championships prior to doing the joint venture, the expectations for us are always extremely high. And if you don't win the end of the year championship, it's viewed as a failure, whereas 99% of the other orgs in the world would be viewed yeah, as finishing second in your championship as a, as a positive. And, for us, where we finished second last year and, and lost in a best of five in game five, um, it, it's not viewed in that light. So trying to figure out how to build a culture of celebrating the little wins. Uh, like I said, we've suffered so much loss over the past few years. To not be able to celebrate the little wins is important. Um, I've tried to build, um, I view the building the company could be built in during COVID is likening it to building a house. <coughs> you have to have a really solid foundation. Without that solid foundation, at any, at any given moment with adversity, the whole house will fall. So we've tried to build a really solid foundation over the past few years um, to kind of combat the, the, the tough parts of the job. So that's going to be my biggest focus. What do you look for in a resume with hiring someone for eSports? So I love to hire people from outside of eSports. My COO is a Harvard grad with a de master's degree in Russian. Uh, my head of uh, design came from making traditional movie posters. Um, my, my content team came from traditional media, not esports. Um, the only area where I look for esports you know, passion and, and love is on the team side. Because if you, you really need to appreciate and enjoy the game that you're working with that team at. Um, because if, you have to understand why the players are feeling a certain way. On the business side, I try to find the people that are the best at what they do, no matter what the industry is. Um, I feel like it gives me a large pool of candidates. Um, you know, most of my staff are or bi or trilingual, um, which is super beneficial as we look to do content in multiple languages. Um, but I, I definitely try to hire outside the box. I try to give people opportunities. I, I came from a small undergrad school. Uh, so when I was coming up, I was competing with big schools in North America, like uh, Penn State, the big school of Penn, and Ivy League. So 
I like to give people who have no experience on their resume their shots, especially during internships. Um, I, I, because I came up through as an intern, I make sure we have a really robust internship program at T1, uh, bringing kids from all over uh, both Korea but North America um, to give them opportunities. Um, because I was afforded those opportunities, and in a position of power, I'm trying to kind of you know repay the favor. So that's the biggest thing. Is not if I only hired esports people. I would have the, the same exact product as everybody else. So I really try to find people that have a different view, a different point, because I don't want the 200 of me running around the office. I want, I want people that have different opinions that will you know, not just say yes. I want people to have their own opinions and be strong with that. Do you have any red flags or green flags when someone approaches you and says they want to work for you? Uh, the, yeah, the red flag is like when they start off with, I'm a huge fan of T1 since X number of seasons and I love Faker. It's like, eh, okay, well, that's great. And I want to work with him really bad. I'm like, I'm going to stop you there. Right? That, that happens so often. And we've had a couple slip through that got through into the business. And like when you, there's pretty much anyone can go anywhere they want in our building. Our building's 11 stories. It's beautiful. It's in governance in the business history. The only area you should not go to is the League of Legends floor, it's floor three. So when you find people like wandering around the third floor, you know, hey, what are you doing? Oh, no, I'm just trying to find you. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So uh, that's a little bit. Um, I, I think green flags are just super responsive people, whether it's phone call, you know, following up with thank you. And how they're going to act uh, in the company is, is how they're going to act you know, prior to the arriving. So, um, you know, you're looking for people that are going to be really positive uh, and have a more of a glass half full mindset. Because I think that if you, in an industry like esports and gaming in general, it's it, it can be super toxic uh, with the online communities, especially. So, uh, she knows. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, you, you can't have the storm cloud walking around the office, kind of you know, sowing doubt into everybody else. Uh, so. Really look for positive-minded people uh, and problem solvers, people that can think on their feet, people that can think outside the box to help us achieve our goals. Do you or any of your staff encounter any issues that come as a result of generational or age differences, given players are hired as young as 17 or even younger? Um, not with the kids, not with the players. Um, we've, had, we've had players as young as 15. Um, culturally in Korea, because esports is viewed positively now uh, amongst parents, um, it's a viewed as a means to an end for the family to, to have some generational wealth come through the family. So um, the families are involved every step of the way. Uh, we like to keep it a family atmosphere. Um, we stay in constant contact with uh, our players' parents. We have you know cacao threads with them to talk to them and keep them abreast. We, we invite them to the facility whenever they want so they can see how their their sons are living. So, um, but with the kids, uh, jokes. Like I was in a car, we were shooting a content series for BMW, and one of our former players, who's probably 28, I'm 40, so like I just turned 40, so I was playing all of my music, and he didn't know a single song, <laughs> like Notorious B.I.G., he didn't know anything until I got to like 2010, and then he knew some of the, so I was, I was just shocked by that generational gap there. Um, uh, also, the players have different sense of humors of what's funny and what's not. Dad jokes, which I, I that's all I have. Uh, <laughs> don't don't land. Now they have to laugh at my jokes because it's awesome. <laughs> but uh, uh, I've, I've learned that uh, they don't understand. <laughs> also, console games, they don't understand the, the the pain of playing on GoldenEye, and it's like I played it on a TV like recently. It's blurry. And they're used to these graphics that are so realistic; right. it looks like TV. So they don't know the struggle was real back in the back in the day. <laughs> what do you foresee for the future of the gaming industry? So I think this next year you'll see a bit of consolidation um, across multiple components of the industry. Um, I think the past few years have been very much like the gold rush, um, where the the miners, which would be the the esports orgs, aren't making any money, but the guy and gal who sold you the pickaxe and the light and the helmet and the pale, they made out great. So you're going to see some consolidation. I think you're going to see the big teams rise to the top. Teams from uh, like T1 and Gen G from Korea, TSM and Team Liquid from North America, G2 and Fnatic uh, from Europe. 
Um, they're going to be okay, but you're going to see some of the smaller orgs consolidate. Uh, I'm hoping we see a shift away from um, franchise-based models, which have gotten teams into a lot of trouble with these big franchise-based fees that benefit no one but the publishers. Um, and I think you'll see more of a partnership model uh, like you're seeing in Valorant, which is a first-person shooter uh, for Riot Games. Um, and I also think you're going to see more consolidation with third-party tournament organizers uh, beyond the summit, which is one of the big ones the past 11 years, just closed. Um, so there's a group out of Saudi Arabia with, that now owns ESL. They're going to be continuing this consolidation piece. So, um, and I'm hopeful that in America, whereas Korea we built a pipeline of academy systems, the uh, American organizations and leagues start using college as their pipeline versus trying to spend money mining talent. When the talent's going to school and university, use that and form partnerships with universities to actually use those players to bring them to the orgs. Uh, like Sky mentioned, most of the jobs in gaming, much like traditional sports, are not being the pro player, it's being the videographer, the social media coordinator, the graphic designer, the, the event operation. So all those jobs, if they come in with four years of experience from the university, that makes them immensely more valuable uh, to hit the ground running, and that's why internships are so important. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Oh, man. Um, I won't be at T1, I know that. My contract ends very soon, so I will hopefully be back at Comcast, um, be on the board of T1, continuing to help grow there, but also get back in the, the investing side for Comcast. And we, we make a lot of small investments <coughs> in and around the gaming sphere and uh, new tech. So we're doing a lot of things in AI, we're looking at things um, in that space. Um, so. Doing some more of that, getting back more in the traditional sports stuff as well with the Philadelphia Flyers, um, getting a better uh, balance uh, in terms of uh, time away uh, from the home. I travel quite a bit. Um, so uh, the bonus points are nice because I get to fly to Hawaii for free. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would like the, a normal sleep schedule for the first time in four years. So I'm even the bags under my eyes will go away a bit. Or I get a suntan, but I don't know. Can't, beggars can't be choosers. What career options are in the esports or gaming industry? There's so many. I think taking pro players aside, um, much like traditional sports, um, they're all the key jobs that you see that the, the traditional sports teams have, we have in esports and gaming. Graphic design, videography, social media, community management, event operations, finance, accounting, legal. Um, you know, we, we have a full, we have 60 plus employees across the multiple departments. Marketing is a huge one. Retail and apparel design. Um, academy, business leaders and coaches. Um, you know, there's a, there's a need for entrepreneurial people that think outside the box. And you know, gaming's been done the same pretty much for the past 20 plus years. Now you're seeing people start to think things differently. You know, invent new business lines. You know, create energy drinks or launch academies or launch personal brands. So there's a lot of traditional media jobs inside of gaming. Uh, and there, you know, a lot of people, especially on the operation side, there's not a lot of experience in those jobs. So there's a lot of learning on the job, a lot of younger employees coming through. So you know, finding out employees are you know, early to mid-career to get them in earlier versus getting them later and having to retrain them would be really important. What are some professional positions you see becoming more popular in the future? In gaming? Um, lawyers. Uh, <laughs> in Korea, we can sue for malicious online content. Uh, so you know, we, we love doing that. We sue, but we were very sue happy in T1. Um, but I think uh, compliance, I think someone with tech and AI experience, I think AI is in a Eliminate some of the really, really early entry jobs, not just in gaming, but I think across many industries. Um, so I think someone that's really good at app building, AI, you know, as you look at Web3 and how that's adopted into both traditional and gaming space, um, I think there needs to be a step in between, probably more of a Web 2.5, where you're embracing you know, NFTs first minus the crypto and using emails only versus having to create uh, wallets for that, because right now, until the world is educated more properly on what NFTs and crypto are, uh, you're going to have what you had last year with a lot of uh, negativity in that space. Um, but I think a lot more of the professional jobs, uh, and the professionalization of organizations have to happen versus the constant outsourcing for third parties. 
uh, which can be significantly more expensive than having someone as an internal resource. What are some tips you have for people interested in working in this industry? Um, be active early. Uh, get active in college if you can. Uh, you know, work with the your collegiate esports program. Work uh, events and tournaments. Uh, network, uh, network constantly, and don't just get an internship or a job and never talk to the person again for six years and then reach back out and say, "Hey, remember me?" It's like, no, don't. Um, but constantly network. You know, find people that you find interesting and reach out. You'll find that most people in gaming uh, will be pretty uh, receptive and, and kind to and probably respond um, versus uh, the swings and misses I had in traditional sports where no one would respond. So gaming is a little more community based and, and it's a small, small bubble so most people are, are pretty friendly. You'll occasionally find the, the bad apple but uh, most people are happy to help with recommendations, advice and, and, and sometimes it leads to opportunities. So. Put yourself out there. There's a lot of introverts in, the, in our space. Uh, not me, not being one of them. Obviously, um, it, it's kind of good to meet people where they are and, and talk, communicate to them where they're comfortable. A lot of times in these settings, people don't want to ask questions. If you give them their email, you get a laundry list of questions. So um, I've learned that in my staff meeting in Korea, where I hold Western style town halls, and no one asks a question. So for the first three, no one asks them. Now we just do anonymous questions, and I get plenty of questions. So. Um, kind of meeting people where they are and, and trying to find that common ground support. Alright, so now for some fun rapid-fire questions. Ooh, sweet. Mobile or PC? PC. Single player or multiplayer? Um, now, multiplayer, I'm really into Valorant. Before, single player, like I, if I could just have NCAA football back from EA, I would just do a dynasty and recruit all five-star like running backs, quarterbacks, and just throw the ball. Um, but yeah, multiplayer, I play with my daughter a lot now, and my wife, so it gives me something to do. Multiplayer is fun. Keyboard or controller? Keyboard. Character or avatar? Like avatar, uh, sorry, character where you can pick it, like Valorant, or yeah. avatar, like, you know, MLOs where you design. Oh, character. I'm a horrible designer. <laughs> I want someone to do all the heavy lifting for me. And then lastly, K-pop or K-drama? Tricky question, uh, because K-pop is obviously all the rage, we've done some songs at T1, but if you've never seen K-drama, it's the most dramatic shows of all time. Like in creative drama, like in, in a Western drama, you get hit by a car, you kind of like bounce off of it and fall down. In like a Korean drama, you get hit by a car, you like fly through the air. <laughs> it's like, and it's always like this extra twist to it. Like I was watching ET1 class, and I've ever seen that. It's really good. Um, but K drama. When I first got to Korea, when I was at the hotels, I, that's what I would watch. Uh, now it's on like Netflix. It's so much easier. So, um, but I uh, I would recommend K dramas and even something like Parasite, which if you haven't spent time in Korea, the socioeconomic disparity of Korea, where the, the very very rich and the very very poor, having been there for four years and you kind of you've lived it and seen it. So that way, that movie when people are like, oh, it was a cool movie. I'm like, yeah. I was like, but you don't understand it, the economic issue. So uh, it's very much nuanced, and, and it's good to see that Korean entertainment's finally like getting a shine. All right, so now we'll open up, open it up to questions from the audience. Sweet. Does anybody have any questions? I guess I said uh, I heard you say you like bringing in people with different backgrounds to come work with you at one. So that I'm kind of wondering what the onboarding process is like because learning about these sports and gaming in general can be a really, really steep learning curve for people. So I do think it's great to diversify your community, but I'm curious what that's like. Uh, it depends on the role. So for design and video, that's just like shooting a flower on the wall or that's that's easy to learn, right? You're, you're, you're there to design beautiful things and, and shoot things. When it comes to like team operations or marketing, you have to kind of understand the product you're selling. So we, we do a little bit of sessions with our different team leads, with our new employees as we onboard them. So they kind of understand what they're trying to market and sell. Like if you don't know what Valorant is or League of Legends, having like a, a five second refresher course, or the best way to learn is honestly watch the games. I've spent the past four years watching six hours of League of Legends every day, watching scrims. I'm horrible at the game, but at least now I can go complain to the coach and the GM because now I understand like what we should and should not be doing. I can't execute on that, but I learn by watching. Um, but we, we definitely try to, you know, have them study across the different apartments. You know, ask their colleagues, uh, and then if worst case scenario, they can come to me and I can give them a kind of overview. But we try to be pretty forthright. And in Korea too, 
uh, we're able to hire you as a contractor uh, to start or a full-time employee. So a lot of times we hire you as a contractor for one or two years to see if that department works for you. If it doesn't, we're able to kind of shift you around. Because in Korea, uh, you're not able to terminate employees like you are in the U.S. So once you make that hire, uh, VP and below, they're pretty much with you forever. So you have to be really, really good at hiring people. So we try to find um, people with the right drive and, and right kind of um, you know, thought process and, and abilities to, to work well with the, with the small group. Where do you see the game itself going as far as the evolution of the game? and um, Which game? Legal Edits? Any game. I mean, yeah. So most of only have like a 10 year life cycle. Uh, that's why the Legal Edits is kind of an anomaly with going into you know, 13th year or whatever year it is now. Um, you're seeing more and more kind of version twos, like CSGO is about to release CSGO 2, uh, Overwatch just did Overwatch 2, um, Valorant's coming out, but you're seeing more iterations inside the game where they're adding agents, champions, or maps to kind of expand on the games. I think uh, as long as the games stay relevant, you'll see more publishers like what Riot's doing build out the lore of their new game, so they're going to drop a fighting game in the next couple of years. Um, that'll be loosely tied to the universe that's built by League of Legends. So you're going to see more interconnectivity between the games versus making a bunch of standalone games like Valve does with CSGO and Dota. You'll see a lot more connectivity in the IP across so they can, in turn, make that into TV shows and do Netflix shows. That's kind of where they're all trying to be IP-owned and IP-driven businesses that tap into that market that's really into you know, video games. That would, the Last of Us doing really well. Everyone needs to find the next video game. And Comcast, we're doing Mario. We just built Mario Land at our Universal theme parks in California. Everyone's trying to figure it out. If you go to Japan, Mario Land's already open, and it's awesome. It's like you're in the video game. So everyone's trying to figure out what that new piece of IP is that can be a theme park or a TV show. But see, you can see a lot more IP focus. You just said that um, most games nowadays only have like a 10-year lifespan. That kind of makes no sense to me. Within that same breath, you kind of talk, started talking about Mario, yeah. like, which has been around our entire lives. Yeah. Like, what decides that? Like, um, is it just like popularity, or like, because like they yeah. seem popular for a long time, and then that just stops at the Yeah. Or it just doesn't age with like the person that they're trying to basically. Yeah. Well, I think to. about so for Mario, right? Super Mario, Mario Two, Mario Three. There's multiple different games. Okay. Smash Brothers. So they've changed their IP along the way. And they've leveraged that IP across different titles to, to use the Mario. Um, I think it's more community driven. I think you know it's the keeping up with the Joneses of like, is your competitor doing anything different? So when Overwatch came out with their shooter, that was different and unique. Everyone was into it. It was six on six versus five on five or four on four. Um, you know, Call of Duty was still one of their IP pieces and that was doing really well. Then Valorant came out and kind of took the best of a first-person shooter in Call of, Call of Duty and Counter-Strike, and then all the abilities of Overwatch kind of merge the two. And I think it's more about who, who's the target audience, what, what's the community support of it. Um, you, you've seen the, the kind of fracture of the Overwatch game where they didn't invest in the game because they were waiting for Overwatch 2, and they missed their window, and now everyone's kind of turning to back to Counter-Strike or Valorant. So I think it's very much community-driven. It feels like the community wants to be heard a lot of the times, and if the, the players feel like the publisher is not listening to them, they kind of move on. Um, but esports is, is missing the mark in the sense that our biggest event last year for League of Legends drew a record of 5.4 million viewers, but the player base of League of Legends is like 180 million users. So we only have a fraction that's you know plays the game and doesn't watch the game. So how do you grow that slice of the pie? It's really important for sustainability. If they can't figure that out, League will kind of fall off and Valorant will, will do really well. It's already outpacing League of Legends in both America, Japan, South America, everywhere but Korea. We're the only market where Valorant is pacing behind the. I have a second question. Like, yeah. Back into that, kid, man. Sure. Um, do you, have you spoken to the people um, with, um, involved with League to figure that out? Because like, it seems like it's about to be getting to where it's going, but like, I, I don't even want to think about that. It's a great game, yeah. and they can have League of Legends too, so yeah. is there someone working on that? Not that they tell me. I mean, I complain uh, with my complaining emails and calls. Uh, I'm talking to Chan Needham next week when they get back from Korea, uh, who's the head of eSports for, for Riot. Um, you know, it's they have to solve for that problem, and, and 
they have to pivot that model away from the franchise-based league. Mm -hmm. Now that the reason to not pivot away before was all these organizations have built these businesses off of it and they're now worth $300 million. And guess what? No, they're not. <laughs> like Face Clan is publicly traded, they're worth 45 million bucks. You know, we have to get away from the franchise model. Either you give the fees back or just you know, don't have to pay anymore and go back to the open ecosystem, the European football model where there's relegation to have a healthier system. Because there's right now no incentive to invest in tier two and tier three League of Legends. Because either you're in the pro league or you're not. And they have to get back to community roots to it to make it more uh, enticing and compelling. Thank you. Yeah. So what kind of different businesses do you then see connecting with esports to kind of help bridge that gap? Which gap? Uh, the gap in um, between like how many players actually play the game and how many players yeah. uh, just watch esports. Like, how can that gap be filled with, uh, I guess, facilitating things outside of esports? As a game player, you play games, right? Mm -hmm. We like free stuff, and you got to entice them to watch it via skins, via you know points, riot bucks. That's the only way you're going to do it. You have to treat it as a marketing opportunity to get hours watched over there. Um, you can you can try to install in-game players, but it'll kind of monopolize what you're doing on, on Twitch and YouTube and, and the other platforms. So um, they have to incentivize the players that are playing but not watching. Um, and they also have to integrate the casual player more with the famous athletes like Faker. Because uh, they might not even know who he is. And maybe they do. but. Uh, they probably didn't have his skins from when he won Worlds, but if they had never met him, never had an opportunity to engage, there needs to be more engagement at that level to entice them to feel good about wanting to watch the sport. So, uh, a couple questions ago, you talked about the disparity between uh, you know, the upper echelon, like the pro level, uh, and also sort of the grassroots in Tier 3 and Tier 2 esports. Uh, is uh, T1 planning on doing anything to support grassroots community efforts or to build out somewhat of that smaller space? So we have a, an entire eSports Academy where we get kids through, we're, we're hosting events. Um, we're actually super restricted by Riot in terms of we have no event license, yeah. which is shocking considering that we're one of your top teams and I can't even hold a tournament. So um, they've solved it for Valorant where they've given you kind of tertiary licenses to do small community-based events in Korea, but they can't compete with any of the windows of Valorant, which also happens to be on the weekend. So imagine trying to tell someone to skip school or play my tournament on a Wednesday. So we have to solve for that. Um, League of Legends, I have no rights. I can't do anything with the community, which is unfortunate because we have the best academy system. I have four of my five players came through my academy. They point at my academy when they do their staff meetings and say how great this is for us, but I can't even host tournaments in my arena next to my building. So uh, Riot needs to be a, a, a good partner to the teams that allow us to host this event because no one can host a better event than the teams that are you know playing in them and, and you know have the, the, the bandwidth to do it. So yeah, we need more partnership from our friends at Riot. Yeah. I guys want to ask because you did start with a marketing major, correct? I did, yeah. So you are working in this community, like you mentioned, it, it can be toxic and get a little bit crazy. I know. And you're considering South Korea almost has a like a more heavy cancel culture and ideal of celebrities and things like that. And you're working with kids as young as 15 years old. Yep. I was wondering how uh, you know PR, crisis management, how all of that planning plays out because you are kind of in the spotlight where you have gamers who are celebrities who grew up doing this thing also maybe start when they're too young to understand yeah. the repercussions of certain things. Yeah, it's the it's the constant struggle. Um, you know, I think it's human nature to want to Google yourself or neighbor yourself in Korea. And especially after a match or whether you do bad or not, and not do well. And we try to tell or explain to our kids, don't do that. Don't don't worry about outside the four walls of the building. Like worry about your teammates and like everyone here. Um, we try to protect them as much as we can, but they're 18, 19, and when you know whether it's good or bad, and when you're getting positive or negative attention, their DMs are open, even though we tell them to keep them closed, because they want both aspects of it. They when it's going well, they want to be able to be contacted. And when it's not going well, you know, it's it's really the darker side of it. So 
Yeah, we do training sessions when we bring players in. Um, you know, Riot, I had to make the suggestion for Valorant where we have multiple countries competing in Korea, including Japan, India, you know, Singapore, uh, Indonesia. And I explained to them, it was like, and they want us to be bantering and talking and talking trash. And I was like, are you going to give us the opportunity to have the teams give us the do's and don'ts of what's funny and what's not? So for example, I learned pretty early on in my time in Korea things about Japan. There's certain things you just don't go there. But if you don't tell a foreign team that's coming to Korea about that, that they might make the mistake of making a joke about something that's not funny. So they were like, oh, it's a great idea. It's like, well, why am I telling you that we should do that? Like, do you think, things like that, they, they haven't they've slipped through the cracks. With our kids, uh, we have a sports psychologist. Um, he comes once a month, uh, which in Korea, mental health is, is taboo. You don't talk about it. You don't, you know, it's just not a thing that you know, work hard. If you're, if you're struggling, work harder. Right? And we've kind of changed that a little bit with having this specialist come through. And uh, I think it really helps the players, especially around communicating with each other in high stress situations where the weight of the world on, is on them from the gaming community to, to win and win big. So having someone that they can talk to that kind of has no idea about gaming, which is, which is great. Uh, he had no idea who any of the guys were, which is even better. Um, but it's a super helpful resource uh, for them. But we do what we can. We try to go after malicious posters on the Korean sites for them. Uh, we stay in contact, you know, contact with their families make sure that they're, they're calling home and making sure that if they're hearing or seeing anything from talking to their sons. Um, but we can't police the internet. It's the one thing I can't do. I can try to tell them, I can block websites on the computers at, at the office, but I can't block their phones. So it's, it's you have to let them you know, grow to be adults, um, but there's scenarios where we, we, we can't protect them from every scenario that pops up. Um, but we try to do what we can and, and educate them with the the benefits of the online life versus the, the real life. Part of the reason we don't, we don't have PCs in the player apartments. If you want to come on a computer, come to the HQ. We have, you know, fiber and 5G and there's no PCs in the apartments. It was only in there during COVID because they couldn't come to the building. Because we don't want them to go home and to get out of that vicious cycle of online harassment, right? Or, or adulation. If someone's telling you you're so great, you're gonna keep messaging them back until you're not great, right? And then it's like, you're not great. So we, we try to thread the needle there with them. And they're so young, and I get it. Like, I've, I've Googled myself. It's not great. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, sometimes it is. But um, you, you kind of have to take the, the good with the bad. And, and, and you know, as you mature, it's easier to kind of decipher. What I've learned in four years, Twitter is not real life. Like, the communities that are yelling on Twitter is not indicative of how everyone feels. But it feels like it at the time, because the loudest voices are the ones that hurt the most. So um, once I figured that out, I stopped uh, feeling so bad about the internet comments. Yes? Uh, so I understand that you want to uh, expand out to like, other countries in different languages. And I think that like, because it's a franchise, it can be hard to get like, different language casters and stuff like that. But what's stopping you from um, like, doing something smaller, like putting different language subtitles in like, T1 content or something like that? So we don't have, I, I don't know, or I, I can't hire fans to do the content translation because if I don't speak <coughs> Vietnamese, or Filipino, or Japanese, if our content, like if the language is not perfectly translated, we get the emails through our inbox complaining about the translations. And if we have no experts on staff that know the base level of that language, um, we could be in serious trouble if something mistranslated. Um, especially for anything involving Faker. We've had mistranslations from an agency in China uh, from some of his interviews that wrote that he said something he didn't say and caused a lot of backlash. So that's my biggest hesitation with that is not having someone on staff that speaks the language that can double check. Uh, you know, part of the reason why we caught some of the things in China is I have a Chinese operations team that kind of was like, wait a minute, something's wrong. Um, so I have a Japanese staffer that's going to help with the uh, Japanese subs for um, League and Valorant. Um, but until I get some more staff that's more uh, language friendly, that's my biggest fear because I'm worried about self-inflicted issues uh, of translations and causing more headaches for everybody than uh, it's worth to, to get a couple more views in the video. Yeah. 
I'm just wondering if you could share your insights on, you know, T1 as a company, uh, courting non-endemic um, companies and sponsors, right? When, when, when you go to them or they come to you, what are they, what are they looking for in the esports space? What are they trying to get out of it? Because I know you mentioned you know, companies like BMW and whatnot, right? Like, what are they, what are they trying to get out of esports, and how are you able to successfully get them involved? So, car companies wanted to get young and cool. They wanted to go, they wanted the 18 to 35 year olds, um, and they wanted to capitalize on the influx of, you know, acceptance of Korean culture, so K-pop and all that. Um, traditional, like, we, we partnered with Red Bull, which is out of Austria, we have part of the corporate office. They're looking to market cool events in cans. They don't really care if they sell any, you know, more Red Bull in Korea. They want to be tied to cool athletes and storytelling. Um, the biggest thing with non-traditional sponsors is you kind of have to educate them along the way because they are coming in blind and you know they they want to do the golf sponsorship and like plaster the logos up and like hospitality and I don't have any of that I have a couple kids that don't want to talk to you that don't, don't probably use your product that can give you eyeballs that other people can't give whether it's streaming whether it's competing so educating on them, on educating the sponsors on what we can and can't do, and we try to having come from the sponsorship side of the world, and in my early part of my career was how you analyze sponsorships and values there. We have to make sure that we over deliver on the non-traditional partners because they're the, per the first ones to go. If we lost BMW after they verbally committed to extend for three years, a month before the year was over. So now, luckily, I have a new auto sponsor coming in in May, but like. That was a huge gaping hole because they have big checks to write. So that's always been the biggest issue is we've had to go outside the walls of Korea to get more money because there's only so many sponsors. And we already have the biggest sponsor in Samsung. And SK Telecom is one of the, the fourth biggest company. So we have the two, two of the four. Uh, and we, we have to go outside there to get more. Uh, that's why I've been pushing for an APAC minus China League of Legends League because we need the money from Japan, Philippines, Singapore, and Vietnam. And, uh, no one's receptive to that because the other teams don't want to lose their slots. But um, there has to be done to stop prioritizing in-person viewership of 400 people versus the you know, 500, 600,000 people that are watching outside. Yeah. Do you feel like any other <clears throat> esports organizations take advantage of uh, outside sports businesses like T1 does um, to really leverage the, I guess, popularity of esports in uh, Asia? Uh, not in Asia. I think many have tried to come. Uh, it is, it's, it's a tough one to crack. It's easier to go west, which we uh, we were trying to do, versus coming coming east. If you have no connectivity to Korea, uh, I, I definitely learned with Korea. Unless you know somebody, the door is locked. Um, so when we first got to Korea, SK Telecom walked us around and opened all the doors for us. And then we kicked them down and kept them open. Versus teams that are trying to come through for the quick uh, Korean dollar, it doesn't work. You have to have roots there, you have to be uh, established and, and have kind of friends in the space. Now, a lot of teams in the West are doing really well with satellite businesses. You know, TSM has a, uh, a data business that they use with Stock UG. Um, Team Liquid does really good with their media house uh, and their agency business. So. Um, teams are doing well there, but no one's having the same success in, in Korea or Asia at large. Just because it's very segmented, each market is super different than, you know, Korea is different than Japan, different than, you know, Vietnam. So, um, it's, you have to have market targets. And, and in India, the reason that we're not even there yet is we need a partner. India is much like Korea. If you don't have a partner, you're going to eat a lot. So, you know, we're trying to make inroads so we can get into mobile gaming in India. Um, because we think that's a, a huge opportunity for growth. Um, but without a partner, T1 going in there will be out in three months and will waste a lot of money. So knowing where to partner and then where to go alone is, is super important. All right. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so, um, sorry, so I have two questions. So sure. uh, my for our first question, I want to loop the conversation back into franchising. Yep. And so I was very surprised to hear that he has such, like, opposing statements to franchising because I was coming to this meeting, I was under the impression that T1 was just like all about like they want just be only involved in like, the big franchise esports like Valorant or League and it's just seeing like how you recently like how T1 recently dropped MKLeo from Smash. Like um 
I was just like, but you did bring up very good points about how like franchising does hurt like, economically wise, like say like for example the Overwatch League, how so many orgs invested so much money into yeah. like Overwatch League and it turned out Overwatch League didn't turn out to be as successful as everyone thought it was going to be. Um, but on the other side though, I come from two esports, so namely Smash and Counter Strike, where like as you know like with Smash we're in like, the literal dark ages right now, where like, we don't know if tournaments are going to even be a thing anymore. Um, Steve thing, um, and then with uh, Counter Strike, like even though like, the whole Counter Strike two news was just news that only came out like two days ago, like we were like this scene in Counter the pro scene in Counter Strike has just been like dead in like NA, like we're at the point where we'd be excited about like a CSGO Twitter banner change, yeah. and so like I was thinking like is the ants is franchising what's necessary for these scenes or like what should like players or TOs are namely like developers like Valve and Nintendo be doing to try like promote these smaller scenes and try and kind of quote unquote save them. I don't know why Nintendo doesn't support esports. It, it blows my mind, especially that they know that Project L is coming from Riot, mm -hmm. which is just going to take all of their players. So and all the Smash team wants is stability and prize pools, mm -hmm. and they can't even get that. Now. And it's very frustrating. I mean, I would love to have kept Leo, but there was no, you know, reward at the end of the tunnel because Nintendo just doesn't support the community or the game, and we have the best player. Yeah. And even, even, what do we do with them? If they, like, hey, this event is not going to happen, or you don't know if the event gets canceled a week out, like, it's just so frustrating. With Counter Strike, it's the best esport to watch. Mm -hmm. It's super popular in Europe and South America. And everyone in North America seems to be pivoting towards Call of Duty or Valorant. Mm -hmm. um, part of it could be community toxicity. Part of it could be Valve's aloofness in terms of how they operate their esports and just the laissez-faire of everyone gets a license and can do whatever they want. Um, but it's the best game to watch. Challenge with Valve, especially at the grassroots level of, of high school, college. Terrorists versus counter-terrorists will never yeah, be accepted at any college or high school. You just can't. So there's just no financial incentive for like orders to invest into these types no. of small things. Now you can make good money in skins in, in, in Counter-Strike, but then there's the dark side of the skin sales and the gambling and everything else. So you have to kind of draw a line of you know the ethics question of where do you feel comfortable. And some works felt really great with taking FTX money or crypto.com or whatever. Okay, that didn't work. I, I looked at crypto deals all of last year, and when we got to the five yard line, I said no, and I, I pulled out. Because what they're asking for is your is your soul and your name, and for a little bit of money. And it wasn't worth the backlash that would have happened and having to support that decision versus doing small NFT projects and cooler things that don't involve ruining the entire brand. So, back to your original point. The games themselves are great, but the, the support or lack of support from the publisher is why gate, public Valorant is succeeding because of all the publishers. It's going to come out. The skin sales for Valorant um, for the lock-in pack was worth a lot of money for all of us teams. And that was unbudgeted money that's going to come through the org that the players get a piece of. That if they just did that in League of Legends, that would be great. I could fund my whole org uh, with the mid lane skin for Faker. <laughs> Valorant needs to catch up to CSGO with the marketplace, then do a great job there. But figure out the way to make sure it's not you know, abused or gambled or, or, or astronomically uh, you know, un, 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 unable to sustain. And then my second question is the uh, mainstream appeal of esports actually. Um, like, so right now we're doing a little bit of a recession and like kind of low point for esports. <coughs> One point I saw brought up is that like, Unlike traditional sports where like football and basketball, so that people who watch football and basketball don't necessarily play those sports. Whereas when it comes to esports, like a lot of those audiences for those games come in their niche. Like League of Legends players don't really watch like fighting game tournaments, fighting game tournaments don't water watch like counter shooters. And then as even more so for people who are not even involved in gaming. And you see this in like um, the say like the horrific Olympic um, game roster. Oh, yeah. Archery? Come on. <laughs> so how, what do you think that we could do to try to make um, every esports just more like accessible for like broader audience to watch apart from just their actual game population from the players who play them? 
Well, they have to tackle the players that play them first because, like I said, we have 5 million viewers for our biggest event and 180 million players. So what they have to stop doing is trying to be traditional sports because there is no media rights for esports. That's why, you know, crappy NFL teams can do nothing but get their $7 million check or $700 million check mm -hmm. and they're good to go. Esports has no luxury. If there is a media rights deal, it goes right to the publisher, a la the Overwatch model. And if there's not, teams are forced to be the marketing arm for the games. So they have to grow the base of people that actually play the game before trying to get the player's mom and dad, which was a really big uh, area of interest in 2018 and 19. It was like, put it on ESPN and get mom and dad to watch it. Like, get the players that are playing the game to watch first. Do a better job of keeping them engaged and then worry about making some content so people understand what the heck game they're watching. Because Overwatch, League of Legends, some of these games are really hard to follow. Dota, yeah. like, other than the shooting games, which are pretty self-explanatory, and Rocket League, which is the greatest, it's a car playing soccer. <laughs> and Smash, it's fighting. Like, it's, it's so hard to understand what you're looking at. So that's why the barrier entry is like the game is difficult to understand, and the itemizations, and no one understands it. You have to have the, the dummy stream, like the, the dumbed down, the, new, the newbie stream. Give, tell the people what the scuttle crap is. Like, what is that? Like, what does it give you? Like, have that information available versus assuming that everyone watching this broadcast knows exactly who that person is, or what the dragon does. And we're not, as publishers or, or teams, able to get casual viewers because you're looking at something that's so foreign. It's like watching a foreign language film, yeah. not speaking the language. I went to a movie premiere in Korea. It was all in Korea with no subtitles. I understood it was action because it was punching the guy in the face. I had no idea what the words were, but when I could see someone was getting angry, I was like, okay, he's mad. But we're, we're making people guess that for a 45 minute match, mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't even know this. So. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. This brings us to the close of the program. Thank you to Joe for sharing your experiences with us, and thank you, Sky and UHD Sports, for making this collaboration with Pace possible. Before we get into the networking portion, let's take a photo. <laughs>